So welcome everybody to this session. My name is Yuri Dagan. I'm the CEO of Youth Biotherapeutics. And today I'd like to tell you about partial reprogramming and uh, in particular its application to the brain, which is what precisely we're doing at Youth Bio. And uh, um, just a few words about who I am, just so you know. Um, I've been a drug developer for over 15 years and I've been a longevity activist for over a decade. And uh, I'm one of the earliest proponents of partial reprogramming. As you can see on the slide, I founded the first company dedicated to partial reprogramming in 2017 and uh, to translate partial reprogramming into therapies. Unfortunately, I was a bit too early. Investors thought I was kind of crazy trying to uh, activate Yamanaka factors in the brain. Uh, but uh, thankfully, other people came into uh, the area, like people like David Sinclair and investors got much more comfortable and people like Jeff Bezos or Yuri Milner poured like $3 billion into partial reprogramming companies. And so in 2020, I started Youth Bio, where our focus from the very beginning was on the brain. And uh, let me just uh, say a few words about why I'm so bullish about partial reprogramming and then I'll dive deeper exactly what partial reprogramming is for those of you who don't know. But the next few slides are just like a movie trailer preview of what's to come in my presentation and why partial reprogramming is so awesome. And it's, it's awesome because it has the potential to completely revolutionize medicine. And if in 2017 I was one of the few to recognize this potential, as I mentioned now, there's a lot more people like Jeff Bezos who've also recognized it and poured billions of dollars into it. Like I mentioned Altos Labs, which is probably the most, na most uh, known example. There's also Sam Altman who financed Retrobuy with like $180 million. There's uh, Brian Armstrong of Coinbase. He's financing New Limit with $100 million. So partial reprogramming now is, is re really taking off. And for good reason, because reprogramming has been shown to rejuvenate cells, fully rejuvenate cells on the cellular level and ameliorate hallmarks of aging. And so it's been demonstrated to be effective in many different cell types and different cell types have like different diseases associated with it. So there's like dozens and dozens of diseases in which partial reprogramming can have potentially therapeutic benefit. So collectively, this has the potential to be like a trillion dollar field if these therapies are indeed um, proven to be effective and safe and go on the market. And it all started with this paper, this 2016 paper by Ocampo et al. out of the Salk Institute, which demonstrated that partial reprogramming can extend lifespan by up to 50% in progeric mice. These mice are fast aging mice, but yet this is a very compelling result. And it showed that not only was their lifespan extended, it also showed they had many other benefits relative to hallmarks of aging or relative to their hist tissue histology. Basically, it made tissues look younger, or at least physiologically younger. And also, more importantly, recently, there is a result in normal mice, uh, completely normal mice, not transgenic animals, with a gene therapy approach who've been shown to extend lifespan by partial reprogramming. The previous model was a transgenic animal, so it's, it's really complicated to translate this into humans because we are already kind of formed without Yamanaka factors. So we need a gene therapy approach, and this paper kind of recapitulated what we would expect from a therapeutic standpoint. It had a gene therapy with OSK delivered to these old mice, and that extended their lifespan by not much, but as a proof of concept showing that it's possible to use partial reprogramming to extend lifespan of normal animals. And as I said, this is a preview. I'll go deeper into each of these things later on in the presentation. Uh, but uh, also, besides extending lifespan, partial reprogramming has been demonstrated to be effective in many different models of disease. I mentioned, theoretically, it could be a trillion dollar market because by now I think there's been like a dozen studies in different disease models showing some sort of therapeutic benefits. And this slide is about Alzheimer's, which is very dear to my heart, and this is what we're doing at Youth Bio, showing that partial reprogramming can have beneficial effects, beneficial therapeutic effects, in a mouse model of Alzheimer's. And I was very happy to see this paper. This is not by our, our group, but we're also doing, of course, Alzheimer's research. And this essentially validated the findings that we observed in our studies of our gene therapies in our Alzheimer's mouse model. So now that you're hopefully interested to hear more about partial reprogramming, let me give it a proper introduction. But for a proper introduction, of course, we need to talk about why is it that we need to rejuvenate things in the first place? 
And of course, this is because of aging, so we need to talk about aging. But before we do, let me just point out uh, kind of an interesting paradox that we've been discussing here in the past few days that when you ask people, like the general public, do they think we should be eradicating cancer? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we should cure cancer. And you ask them, what about Alzheimer's? Everybody, yeah, yeah, we should cure Alzheimer's. And if you ask them pretty much about any disease, they all think, yeah, diseases need to be cured. We should eradicate all diseases. And then if you ask them, okay, let's imagine we've eradicated all disease and also figure out how to keep you young for as long as you want. How long would you like to live in that scenario? And people still say that, oh, maybe just 100 years. And to me, this is mind boggling. Like, why do you want to have some sort of external, externality determine how long you live? Shouldn't that be your choice? Shouldn't you live you know, for as long as you want rather than have something externally determine that? And it's funny that even within Edge Esmeralda, Mark Amalainen did a poll, only about a quarter of people attending this very progressive you know, gathering of you know, hopefully very smart people, only about a quarter of those people say they would love, want to live indefinitely and others still want some sort of like external uh, expiration date put on them. So um, it, it, <laughs> I, I find that mind boggling because basically you know, this ability, this option to, to determine ourselves, <coughs> the control of our biology, including how long we want to live, I think it's so valuable that we should all be you know, trying to get it and support the research that is trying to um, uh, give this option to everybody in the world. And I think the reason why people uh, don't really, they think they don't want it is just because collectively humanity has this sort of Stockholm syndrome when it comes to aging and death. And I think it's just a textbook case of learned helplessness. And I think Aubrey de Grey put it really well. He said that we all grew up with the idea that aging is inevitable. And so we rationalize that, okay, if it's inevitable, even if it's really bad, we can't do anything about it, so let's just accept it and pretend that we didn't really want it in the first place. Like, oh, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible, so I don't even want to live for as long as I want. But, of course, thankfully, science and technology has been kind of pushing away from, like, pushing on death and aging for the past, you know, many, many years including extending our lifespan. For example, in the past you know, like 100 plus years, we've extended the median lifespan from about 50-ish to like 80-ish. So this is a 30-year increase in, in median lifespan. And there is still room to grow because the oldest humans are known to live to about like 120, just a bit less, a bit less. so there's still a lot of room to grow just within the known human lifespan between 80 and 120. And also, this is just kind of known biology, but of course there's this X factor uh, that can potentially extend it much farther beyond 120. That has to do with current you know, research, genetic engineering, and the novel things that will eventually become modern medicine, which they, they haven't yet, but this is once they do, this has the potential to extend our lifespan much greater because right now we finally, we collectively as humanity, finally have the tools to modify our, our biology in you know, ways we couldn't imagine maybe just a few decades ago. So it's, it's I think, basically what I'm trying to say, it's time to kind of get away from our learned helplessness and at least put ourselves much, much more um, higher goals of what we want to do with our health and our biology. And of course, the inspiration from to, to the previous slide that we can extend our lifespan much more significantly stems from the observations that in nature, there are animals who live much, much longer than humans do by like 100, 200, or even 300 years, they live longer than us. So with the proper tools that are disposable, like genetic engineering, we can potentially you know, reach or even surpass those same lifespans. Because we know that even some mammals, they live for over 200 years. So I don't think it's you know, out of the realm of possibility of figuring out the mechanism behind that and also implementing them within ourselves. And besides mammals, there's a Greenland shark that's known to live over 400 years. Some estimates even say over 500 years. And so the problem that we're trying to solve at Youth Bio and the rest of the longevity field is the aging process itself. We're just trying to do something about, well, about those kind of later years marked by bad health and suffering. And initially, we'd like to figure out how to slow down the aging process, extend the healthy years of our lives, 
then learning to stop aging altogether, just to maybe even prevent ever having to suffer from the diseases of aging, and ideally develop ways to reverse aging for those people who kind of have already entered the not so healthy years of our lives to bring them back into good health and allow them to um, enjoy that good health indefinitely. And so this is why we're called Youth Bio. We want to extend not just health span or lifespan, we want to extend your youth span, which is the most enjoyable and most happy and most healthy time of our lives. And so one possible solution of how we can do this is cellular reprogramming, because on the cellular level, reprogramming has been shown to rejuvenate cells and accomplish pretty much all of the things that I was talking about on the previous slide, including ameliorating all cellular hallmarks of aging that are listed on this diagram. I have a pointer. No, no I don't. Um, but basically, this diagram shows that the reprogramming process reverses all the hallmarks of aging that are known to occur at the cellular level. And so now the biggest challenge for our field is to translate these, these results from the cellular level to the organismal level and enjoy the benefits of rejuvenation in our already adult organisms. And just before we do, go deeper into reprogramming, just like let me briefly talk about what aging is. And actually there's no consensus in the field on people, scientists that study aging don't completely agree, even on what it is. Of course, there's hallmarks of aging, and I think we actually, all of us, know it when we see it. Like, we can very well tell apart an old person from a young person, but then having a precise definition, scientific definition, of course, is a little more complex than that. But, you know, obviously aging involves the worsening of our ability to maintain homeostasis, and it's known to be associated with all sorts of hallmarks listed on the slide. And really, the biggest problem with aging is that it kills us. And the fact that it, it not only that, the uh, rate at which it kills us, or the risk at which it kills us, grows exponentially with age. And so for, like, since about age 10, the risk of dying doubles every eight years. And if for a 20-year-old, their annual risk of death, so risk of dying within one year, is about one in a thousand, which is very low. Just imagine if we are able to freeze aging, that such a person would be like mathematically expected to live a thousand years. But then for a 60-year-old, it's already one in 100, and for an 80-year-old, the risk of dying within one year is one in 10. So you can see the exponential increase in that risk. Uh, and before killing us, of course, aging makes us suffer with this arsenal of unpleasant diseases, all of which also increase exponentially with age. Of course, the two biggest killers are heart disease and cancer. I'm sure most of you know this. And there are a few other unpleasant things like dementia, which you know, also not, not a fun thing to have. Um, and the second biggest problem with aging is that besides actually killing us, it uh, starts so early. The process of aging starts so early. I think we barely get to enjoy our you know, fully grown bodies until and when they start falling apart at like age 40, basically. And the pace of this falling apart is, is infuriatingly quick. So of course, the, the logical question then is, why does aging happen at all? And as I mentioned, scientists can't even agree on what aging is. So obviously, there's no consensus of, on why aging happens. And uh, some people, like John Bear, may think that aging is completely random. Other people kind of on the end of the spectrum think aging is programmed, like me. And there's, I think, then there's uh, this continuum between the, the two poles, something that might be like an accidental program. And obviously, nobody's denying that there are some stochastic random changes with, with aging. The question is, what plays a bigger role and what allows the stochastic events to eventually start accumulating as damage and why doesn't that happen, for example, in the first 20 years of our lives? I won't get into like the uh, debates on the, uh, what exactly causes aging. We can just, uh, for now, for just for the benefits of, of this presentation, look at empirical facts and kind of draw on conclusions in terms of what things we can modulate and what things matter more and what things matter less. Look at just kind of the animal kingdom and inform our opinion on what we think are more important or less important aspects of aging. And I think epigenetics is a more important aspect of aging, just kind of like a preview, and the next few slides will try to make that point. And of course, this slide, uh, I think the main takeaway is that aging is just not universal. There's so much variation in lifespans and so like rates of aging in the animal kingdom. Some species live just for a few days, 
Other species live for like thousands of years. And even within the mammalian kingdom among mammals, the variation is like two orders of magnitude. Mouse lives two years, a whale 200. And so, um, but even within much closely related species than a mouse and a whale, like for example, this genus of rockfishes, which are you know very similar evolutionarily related species on kind of their, their phylogeny, they have huge variations in lifespan between like some, some rockfishes live just 10 years and others live for over 200 years. And it's not just two species, it's a continuum of 50 different species with kind of very smooth increase from like 12 years to 205 years between them. So again, uh, aging within like, I think on uh, the power of evolution to really adapt to a particular ecological niche, aging can be varied very, you know, easily, at least on the evolutionary time scales. And I already made the, the point that aging is not universal, but uh, this slide tries to show just how variable the patterns are in the animal kingdom. And to me, this means that there's no single fundamental like physical law. Like say, some people say, oh, it's the second law of thermodynamics, entropy has to increase. But actually, when it comes to the aging of biological systems, that's obviously not why we age. And of course, being open systems, we can take in energy and matter and decrease entropy. And so there has to be, a bi aging has to be a biological phenomenon rather than just a phenomenon of physics. And clearly, aging is under genetic control uh, because you know, DNA determines how long a species lives. And of course, there's some variation between individuals. There could be also some inputs uh, based on environment, but all of this happens within the confines of the life history encoded by genomes. And uh, this is, I mean, we understand this from a basic level. That's everything encoded in the DNA that then drives the morphology, you know, morphology and the subsequent life history of a given species. And the good news is that genetically prolonging lifespan might not require massive genetic manipulation as kind of two quick examples show here. In, in mice, just a single gene, uh, actual knockout or knockdown can greatly extend lifespan and by almost uh, like 70%. And in uh, nematodes, a single gene knockout increased the lifespan by 10 times. So obviously with simple genetic manipulations, it's possible that we can greatly uh, increase lifespans. And also artificial selection can ex uh, greatly extend lifespan as well. This is a famous Michael Rose experiment in fruit flies, which initially increased lifespan in those flies by like 30%. They continued running this experiment for like many, many years. And ultimately they claim to have extended lifespan of these fruit flies with just like, you know, random mutation, but artificial selection by up to seven times, which shows that on a very, very small evolutionary time scales, like our time scales, you can greatly increase lifespan. And so to me, this shows that there's a lot of potential for lifespan increase with genetic, and I'll make the case later, epigenetic modulation. And so uh, the next few observations are devoted to, to this uh, hypothesis that it's also epigenetic modulation that can greatly uh, vary lifespan on the level of a single individual. And of course, this has important implications for us because I think we all want to also be able to extend our lifespan rather than kind of live with the happy thought that eventually evolution might extend human lifespan sometime in the future. I think we actually want to get to live to see that they ourselves. And so the next few observations uh, that are kind of summarized on this slide, I'll just quickly go into some detail uh, about them, why I think there's a strong case that there's epigenetic control of aging as well. And just briefly, for those of you who might have not heard what epigenetics is. This slide tries to summarize it. Basically, epigenetics is control of gene expression. So we are a multicellular organism. We have 200 different cell types, but of course, each cell has the identical copy of DNA. And so for each different cell type, we, the cell needs to have a certain set of genes on and off. And so the mechanisms that control this are called epigenetic mechanisms. And there's various different mechanisms. I won't get into like the exact which ones. Basically, we need, we need this system of control of gene expression, and this is what we call epigenetics. And also within aging, we observe that these epigenetic changes happen during our aging with 
some genes kind of going down in the volume. There's also, it's not just a binary on or off, there's also like a volume knob, and some genes get silenced, other genes get upregulated, and these mechanisms are uh, being observed to be play an important role in aging. And let me just now share a few more observations from nature that I think show that aging could be under epigenetic control. And of course, the most clear example of this is social animals, where you have identical DNA in the same kind of uh, twins, essentially, determining very different lifespan. If uh, this individual ends up being a queen, it lives by you know, several times or sometimes an order of magnitude longer than the same individuals with the same DNA, but who went to the worker path. And an even more extreme disparity is observed in ants. Their ant queen lives for like up to 30 years, and worker ants live like just one or two years. And yeah, like when I first found out about examples, my eyes <laughs> were like enlarged just like yours. I'm like, holy, as a small insect that lives longer than a horse, or like twice as long as a dog. This is like incredible. That's probably longer than most mammalian species. 30 years, and uh, yeah, this, I like, wow. Uh, I really like this example because previous examples, of course, they were based on like the social role of the insect, and some people argue that essentially it's like two different programs in the same DNA that just like at birth, you go one path or another that determines your lifespan. But in this case, this shows that epigenetics can influence the lifespan even in the context of a single individual and it can actually be reprogrammed uh, epigenetically and have a much longer lifespan. In this case, if this ant, it, it's born as a worker, but then under some uh, circumstances in the colony, if the, if the queen dies, workers can become breeders, and in that case, their lifespan is significantly extended. And so this, to me, shows again the power of epigenetics to modulate and change the fate and lifespan of an already formed individual. And here's an example, another example uh, of extreme variation in lifespan brought about by epigenetics, and I like it even more because monarch butterflies, they do not have different social roles. And the only thing that determines how long they will live is the season in which they're born. If they're born in the summer, they live very short, like about a month, but if they're born in the fall, then they need to migrate down to Mexico for the winter, and basically in that case, they live for like nine months. And so this is, again, an example how epigenetics can greatly modulate the lifespan of a species. And we even observed this in some mammals, because there's this rodent in Montana that have a similar pattern that if they're born in the spring, then they sexually mature within the same year, they breed and they die by the end of the year. But if they're born in the fall, then their development is put on pause and they actually sexually mature after the winter. And so this also greatly extends their lifespan. And the previous examples, they were like about insects or animals. Of course, we're much more interested in ourselves, humans. And while we don't have as clear examples of epigenetics playing a role in our aging, but now we have at least circumstantial evidence that there is also epigenetic control of our lifespan thanks to these epigenetic clocks that have been discovered about a decade ago or even more than a decade ago by now. And they show that uh, there is this clock that ticks in our cells, even sometimes very different cells. And the, this slide shows different tissues which show that this clock is synchronized between cells as different as a neuron and a blood cell, and yet they show the same epigenetic time. And so if you take a cell from an individual, you can actually tell how old that individual is without knowing anything about them. Uh, and so this shows that there is a, some sort of epigenetic process. Some people, like myself, argue epigenetic program running that uh, with aging uh, modulates uh, the epigenetics of very, very different cells. And another observation about these epigenetic clocks that they actually take slower in animals that undergo known interventions, no interventions known to extend lifespan or slow down aging. So basically they show that these clocks are kind of causative and not just correlative. So if you use an intervention to slow down aging, basically this will be reflected in the clocks. And if, if you weren't yet convinced that epigenetics plays a key role in aging, I hope that maybe the next few slides will 
maybe convince you, because uh, these ones present uh, the latest discovery that not only do all mammals have these epigenetic clocks, this was worked by Steve Horvath and, and, and his colleagues, but you can actually build a pan-mammalian epigenetic clock that has the same underlying sites in the genome. So basically it's like a, a conserved epigenetic clock that reuses the same sites in the genome between very different species. And the only difference between those clocks is of course the speed with which they tick. So they use the same sites in the genome and the only difference is the speed with which those sites in the genome change over age. So basically you could say that a mouse epigenetic clock just based on, built on this CPGs, just uh, is ticking 30 times quicker than a human. It's still the same, same kind of epigenetic program, it just ticks faster. And I think this is a compelling evidence that there's some underlying epigenetic program running with aging. And so, also these clocks have been shown to be very accurate across pretty much all mammals, regardless if they're short-lived or long-lived. And to me also, another convincing observation is that the clocks, they were built based on adult tissues. And yet when they observe the epigenetic timing in uh, tissues from like embryos or development, developing uh, uh, individuals, they show that the clocks recapitulate the development process, even embryogenesis. With the only difference being that that process is exponentially faster. So basically, uh, and we also see this kind of remarkable conservation among species. In, essentially, we see that pretty much in all mammals, the first 10% of our life history is spent on development, according to these epigenetic clocks, which moves at an exponentially quicker pace than the, the rest, the other 90% of our life history. And so uh, this, I think, is this, kind of ultimate evidence of a conserved epigenetic program running with at least the mammalian genomes that determines the aging life history or the, the aging trajectory of our species. And so the, the, the basic kind of variable in this program is just the speed at which the clock ticks. So like I mentioned, the mouse clock just moves 30%, uh, 30 times quicker than a human clock. Okay, enough with like so theoretical epigenetic uh, questions. The, I think the question that we're all kind of wondering about is if aging is under epigenetic control, can we actually do something about it? Can we reverse it? Of course, epigenetics is reversible, so it's uh, the logical inference to make is that can we actually use epigenetics to reverse aging? And obviously in nature, we see rejuvenation happen all the time, and uh, it just seems to be reserved for reproduction. In fact, I think it's a requirement for reproduction. Without rejuvenation, post-reproduction, we wouldn't be here, as I think there would be some sort of accumulation of, of damage from one generation to the next. But thankfully, after fertilization, the damage gets cleared, and we have evidence of this from many different species showing that there is active clearance of damage, there's active rejuvenation that is tied to reproduction. Even in our organisms as simple as yeast, which are just you know, unicellular, single cellular organism, which like a special case, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually, they can just do cloning, and if they do cloning, asexual reproduction, they age, but as soon as they're forced to reproduce sexually through like gametogenesis process, they are rejuvenated. And so uh, this observation seems to be uh, very, again, evolutionarily conserved about this rejuvenation tied to reproduction. And it's been observed you know, also to be the case in mice that also clear damage after fertilization in nematode worms. By, uh, uh, this was shown by Cynthia Kenyon's team. They have the same process of damage clearance in sexual reproduction in frogs. Also, similar observation, there is active rejuvenation happening after fertilization. And, and a very interesting observation, kind of shifting gears again to epigenetics, is that what actually happens when people, what happens after fertilization when people look at epigenetic clock is that the uh, rejuvenation event is not immediate. It doesn't happen right after fertilization, but it, it actually reaches a minimum at about uh, day 10 if we're talking mice, which is uh, coincides with gastrulation. And so this implies that there is some sort of active rejuvenating program 
tied to reproduction that ac actually takes some time to work its magic and rejuvenate cells. And uh, this was a paper by the Gladyshev group. The, this is another paper by the Gladyshev group but by Alex Strapp that also confirmed the, the same findings but at a single cell resolution basically showing that there's an active rejuvenating program happening after fertilization which reaches the minimum during gastrulation. And another paper from the same group, but looking at frogs, showing that in frogs also the epigenetic, free, uh, epigenetic age reaches a minimum at gastrulation. Okay, now let's talk about reprogramming with like this whole uh, preamble of what actually happens during, uh, during aging from an epigenetic standpoint. Now we can talk about what we can do about it and how we can modulate epigenetics. And just historically, uh, I think we should start with the dogma that was prevalent in like the 1940s, or it was formulated in the 1940s and was prevalent until uh, very recently that uh, cell differentiation is a one-way process. Basically everything starts as an embryo and then cells roll down this landscape and differentiate into eventually like a neuron or a skin cell, but they can never come back up. That was the dogma that was called the Waddington landscape formulated by Conrad Waddington and everything pointed that there's some sort of like irreversibility to this process. Uh, however, very quickly, just 20 years later, that dogma was uh, at least the first time proven wrong by John Gurdon, who showed you can actually take a nucleus from a skin cell, put it into uh, a, an egg cell, we're talking frogs here, and you can generate a whole complete organism, and this refuted the, the notion that the skin cell somehow loses the DNA that necessary to form other cell types. And so this was kind of the first instance of uh, at least showing some doubt in the Waddington dogma. And it was again repeated in the 1960s, uh, 1990s, 96, uh, which the famous Dolly the Sheep cloning experiment, which is essentially a repeat of the John Gurdon experiment from like 30 years before. But it again showed that actually, you know, there, there is some potential for reversibility and the, this was conclusively proven in 2006 by Shinya Yamanaka that not only showed that it's possible, he showed how to do it. He showed that if you induce these four factors, transcription factors that are later came to be known Yamanaka factors, then you can take any cell all the way back to this embryonic ground state. And so after this discovery for which he got a Nobel Prize in 2012, and of course, John Gurdon also got a Nobel Prize, they shared the Nobel Prize, the updated epigenetic landscape became essentially bidirectional. It showed that you can move up and down and actually you can move across, you can take a skin cell and trans-differentiate it into a neuron without actually needing to go to the ground state. And with that, finally, uh, after this discovery, we have entered the possibility of how to affect this epigenetic rejuvenation that I've been kind of hinting or talking about in the previous few slides. And the observation that really set people in motion trying to accomplish it was that during reprogramming, the cells are not only epigenetically rejuvenated, they, they don't only go to the ground state based on like uh, development or differentiation, they're also physiologically rejuvenated. Like uh, I mentioned the hallmarks of aging in, in the first few slides, and the first observation came from uh, Jean-Marc Lemaitre's team at Instagram that you can take uh, like cells from very old people, you reprogram them into embryonic pluripotent stem cells, and then you reprogram them back into fibroblasts, and those fibroblasts are fully rejuvenated. It's as if they were from very young people. And so this uh, then got researchers looking at other hallmarks of aging, repeating these, these experiments or doing new experiments, and this is what then formed the basis of this diagram, essentially summarizing many different uh, um, papers and a lot of research showing that all cellular hallmarks are ameliorated by the reprogramming process. And the next logical question for the field of longevity was, of course, can we capture this rejuvenating effects of reprogramming and use it in vivo, use it for rejuvenating adult organisms? And the first attempt at, the, at this wasn't really successful, it, the, but the first ever group to try this was Manuel Serrano's group from Spain in 2013. What they did is they basically created a transgenic mouse model in which these Yamanaka factors were in every cell, but they were silent until you actually induced them. And then they tried inducing them in adult mice 
and uh, they didn't really see a positive effect. Basically, they saw that those mice died like a couple of weeks after they started the induction of the, of the human factors. And so the title of their paper wasn't very reassuring. It was like uh, reprogramming in vivo produces teratomas and IPS cells with potency features. Teratomas are, of course, like tumors. And uh, I, I don't think anybody reading that paper's even title would be you know, very inspired to start doing partial reprogramming. Uh, but thankfully, uh, Alejandro Campos' group was not deterred. And they actually figured out how to use partial reprogramming in vivo safely to get just the positive effects without the negative effects. And the genius of Ocampo and, and his colleagues were that you have to do reprogramming for very short durations. And that's what came to be known as partial reprogramming. Because if you allow reprogramming to proceed too far, you get side effects that eventually kill the mice, which is what you, you don't want. But if you induce Yamanaka factors for just like a couple of days, you get rejuvenating effects. And that what led to this lifespan extension uh, by up to 50% if you compare it to the first control group or 30% if you compare it to the third control group. But basically that was the therapeutic result that they observed. And even visually, like people who work with mice can, can tell the difference. The, like the control group has uh, the kyphosis, this curvature of the spine that is uh, an aging hallmark, whereas the treated mouse does not. But more importantly, not just from appearance, but like on the biomarker level, the level of tissues, the mice that were treated by Yamanaka factors were younger according to these metrics. They have fewer senescent cells, fewer DNA breaks. Uh, their tissue histology was better. Like there's four different tissues listed here, skin, spleen, kidney, stomach, etc. And uh, oh, they had, yeah, even better hair. And hair, of course, is a hair thinning and hair graying is a hallmark of aging. Um, and so this uh, kind of summarizes why I am so bullish about partial reprogramming, basically because I think it works at precisely the level at which our biology happens. It works on the cellular level, and regardless of you know, the matrix and the uh, things that happen around the cells, ultimately all the signals have to be processed by the cell, and the, the cell really decides how old it is, right? If the matrix tells the cell you're old, if we intervene at the level of gene expression and say, don't listen to the matrix, you're still young, we upregulate the genes that you know, are associated with the younger cell, then really we can circumvent the external signaling. Not to say that I don't support other approaches like replacement, I think there's a lot of potential synergy and replacement is also a completely viable option. But I th also think partial reprogramming has a lot of potential because we can actually, by changing the gene expression of the cell, which what, what partial reprogramming does, we can circumvent uh, the aging process. And so I guess one of the next interesting question is, how does partial reprogramming work? What, you know, where does the magic come from? And unfortunately, the exact mechanisms are still unknown. I mean, we know how reprogramming works. And again, from like a very mechanistic standpoint that it opens up chromatin, silences one set of genes, uh, upregulates up or it starts expressing another set of genes and ultimately uh, this leads the cell to this path to pluripotency where it, it starts expressing the genes associated with pluripotency, but where exactly in that process the rejuvenating aspects happen, we still don't know. But uh, let me just kind of share some of my, some observations that, and speculate on what I think might be happening that uh, could explain the rejuvenating aspects of partial reprogramming. And I guess the first question is, so what exactly do Yamanaka factors do? And I think a lot of people already know that Yamanaka factors are the factors that are responsible for maintaining stemness in these embryonic stem cells. But, and they're also known to be these pioneer transcription factors that are able to access closed chromatin and start opening it up. But I think what's less known about Yamanaka factors is that they're also the factors that trigger this maternal to zygotic transition during embryogenesis. And I'm getting maybe a little bit deep into like <laughs> embryology, but this is the process where the maternal genome gets silenced in just a few days after fertilization, and the genome of the you know, ultimate resulting organism starts being activated. And so if you remember the, yeah, and that starts in the blastula stage, and, and 
basically uh, continues in the gastrula stage. And if you remember this paper from the Gladyshin group that shows that embryonic age, embryonic epigenetic age reaches a minimum at this blastula stage, uh, I think, uh, gastrula stage again, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, good reason to believe that there might be some overlap between the rejuvenating program that is normally activated during embryogenesis and basically what transcription factors, Imanaka factors, also trigger in the early stages of the reprogramming process. So basically maybe the same gene networks that are responsible for this rejuvenation that we see during embryogenesis are being activated by the reprogramming process. And um, yeah, and this is, I think this gives a new meaning to this fun quote about gastrulation, that it's not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, that is the most important time in your life because that's what rejuvenates you as an organism. Okay, now just still on the question of how does partial reprogramming work, but switching gears from like the hypothetical scenario to just the empirical observation, we don't know maybe exact mechanisms, but we do know that partial reprogramming leads to rejuvenation. So in particular, the, we can see this rejuvenation on the transcriptomic levels, the levels of the transcripts, mRNA, produced by, by the cell. We see that uh, after partial reprogramming, the pattern, the gene expression pattern, the transcriptomic pattern of the cell is shifted towards the pattern observed in younger cells of the, cell, of the same cell type. And so this is one result showing this. Here's another study showing the same observation that you are rejuvenating cell at the transcriptomic level, the level of mRNA. And of course, I previously showed that partial reprogramming rejuvenates cells at the epigenetic level, the level of epigenetic clocks. And so also on the third level, just the level of physiology, there are also observations that partial reprogramming induces this physiological rejuvenation, improves tissues at, at the physiological and histological levels that are in the cells that are partially reprogrammed. And the question why this is possible, why you know, rejuvenation is possible during the reprogramming process, I think we're just lucky that the reprogramming process is gradual, both in the changing of cell identity and in the rejuvenating aspect. And this slide shows like the two trajectories, one trajectory of silencing the genes responsible for like fibroblast identity, and another slide showing rejuvenating, reju rejuvenation. The, the blue line is the epigenetic age of the cell, and we see that this is a gradual process, basically, that cells are gradually reprogrammed, they gradually are moved in the direction of embryonic stem cells, and they're gradually rejuvenated. And so there is some point, like uh, a therapeutic window, basically, where we haven't yet reached the point of no return, where the cell can no longer be a fibroblast, cannot no longer do the function of a skin cell, and yet, at this, still by then, the cell has already been rejuvenated. So we can, if we stick to this therapeutic window, we can push the cell just enough in the direction of embryonic stem cell, but not too far. So it's still a fibroblast, but it's a rejuvenated fibroblast, at least according to this research that looked into rejuvenating process and the epigenetic age that happens during reprogramming. And so this is what, essentially what we're trying to harness. Thanks to this gradual nature of reprogramming, we can find this window of safe partial reprogramming where we get rejuvenation, but we don't yet get the risks associated with the cell stop, stopping doing its job. And uh, uh, just to address another uh, kind of a frequent point of criticism that skeptics of partial reprogramming bring up, they often bring up this uh, well-known fact that in vitro, when you reprogram cells in a petri dish, only a small percentage of cells end up being fully reprogrammed to this pluripotency. Most of the cells do not. And they kind of point to this and say, well, if only a few cells ever get to full reprogramming, then only a few cells will ever be rejuvenated in vivo, and it's never going to be efficient enough as a process to be used as a rejuvenating therapy for an already foreign organism. But those people who actually study uh, in, vivo, uh, in vitro reprogramming, they know, or they know, at least now they know, that the initial stages of reprogramming are exi uh, exerted on all cells. And this initial opening up of chromatin that happens, happens in all of the cells that have Yamanaka factors activated in them. And it's just that 
in most cells, what happens later is chromatin is recondensed, and it seems to be an active process preventing cells from being reprogrammed. But if you actually disable this active process, as this paper showed, this was one of the histone, histone 3 uh, K36, uh, if you want the details, but if you disable that process, then all of the cells in the petri dish actually make it all the way to clear potency. So this implies that actually all of the cells experience the all of the cells experience, experience reprogramming, and in particular the early stages of reprogramming, which are associated with rejuvenation. So we can expect for in vivo reprogramming the cells to pretty much all the cells in which we activate the reprogramming genes to be rejuvenated to some degree because they all experience the initial stages of reprogramming. And so the implications of this are quite profound. Basically, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the problem with the aging process is, or one of the problems, is that it's exponential in increasing our mortality risk. And so if we're able to somehow slow down this exponential increase, or ideally we'd like to stop it or even reverse it, then as I mentioned, the, like a person in, in their 60s has a one in a hundred chance of dying within a year which is for a 60-year-old is, is actually not too bad. If, if we're able to freeze the aging process and stop it right there, then a the 60-year-old person, just with this uh, aspect of reprogramming, just stops the increase in mortality risk, just mathematically could potentially expect to live another 100 years. And if we're able to reverse, of course, the aging process, which I think partial reprogramming, like repeated partial reprogramming, can accomplish, then we can then even rejuvenate people and decrease their mortality risk. And, of course, while that's the ultimate goal, we haven't gotten there yet, we're just making kind of first steps in this direction, but I think there has been many promising steps in that direction since the 2016 Ocampa paper, and just want to highlight some of them in the next few slides that I think are particularly compelling. For example, this study that showed that even a single bout of partial reprogramming can extend lifespan, including in progeric mice and normal mice. Now, this paper, the, uh, many of you have seen it from David Sinclair's group. This is a famous paper where they were able to restore vision in mice with partial reprogramming. Uh, another paper showed that partial reprogramming can improve muscle reg regeneration after injury. Wound healing also, I mentioned in the beginning, there's like a dozen different disease areas in which partial reprogramming has been shown to be therapeutically effective. And these slides just quickly go through them just because we don't have enough time. If we had to deep dive deep into all of them, we'd need a couple hours. Uh, this study showed that you can improve uh, spinal disc degeneration with partial reprogramming. Uh, this study looked at long-term safety of partial reprogramming and showed that even a 10-month ten long protocol of inducing immunocrophy factors is not only safe, but also therapeutically beneficial. This is the same paper, just another slide showing the results, that uh, with a yeah, 10-month long period of induction in mice, it was safe. This study I already mentioned uh, in the beginning, as I said, Skeptics of partial reprogramming have pointed to wild-type mice as being kind of next measuring stick by which par partial reprogramming has it effectiveness has to be measured. And uh, uh, basically, the, the, they were saying that because uh, we haven't yet seen a life extension in normal mice, then maybe partial reprogramming life extension is an artifact of a, a progeric mice. But uh, this paper out of Rejuvenate Bio showed that actually gene therapy approach can greatly increase uh, lifespan in, not greatly, but can increase lifespan in, in uh, normal mice. And also there's been uh, a few unpublished results that just came from a conference where people were reporting unpublished results and they're, again, very, very promising because there's groups showing that partial reprogramming can improve the brain in vivo, uh, liver function, cardiac function, hematopoietic stem cells, and T cell function, and also the David Sinclair's group is pursuing an indication in the eye, this eye stroke indication for using a gene therapy based on partial reprogramming to go into the clinic. And there might be the first group to get partial reprogramming into the clinic. Okay, finally, let's talk about brain rejuvenation. And uh, uh, there's been uh, also a lot of uh, exploration of partial reprogramming in the brain as well, including by ourselves. One of the earlier studies uh, from an Al Sorano's group, who's been a pioneer of partial reprogramming, as, as I showed in 2013. They've continued looking into it, and they showed that partial reprogramming can improve memory on the object recognition test. And this is a very cool result, very recent result, a 2024 paper by Anne group from Stanford, showing that uh, reprogramming, partial reprogramming can increase 
or induce neurogenesis in old mice. Like basically generation of novel neurons in the hippocampus of old mice, which has been a very uh, kind of controversial aspect. Do we get, can we have neurogenesis in adult brains? And with, at least with partial re reprogramming, it seems that we can. Another brain reprogramming company, uh, reprogramming paper from Rodolfo Goya's group in Argentina showing that if you deliver a gene therapy into the hippocampus of old rats, in this case, you can in increase their uh, cognitive performance. And this is uh, very similar to what we've done at Youth Bio. We've delivered the gene therapy into the hippocampus of uh, old mice and also Alzheimer's mice. And we also see positive results. And uh, uh, Rodolfo Goya's group saw uh, improvements in cognitive tests and also saw reduction in epigenetic age of the rats treated by partial reprogramming. They also done a different study on female fertility where they injected uh, female rats in the hypothalamus with partial reprogramming therapies and they showed that after inducing uh, partial reprogramming in that brain region that has positive effects on female fertility. And moving on to Alzheimer's, my uh, personal passion and, of course, the therapeutic focus of youth bio. Uh, there's, from the very beginning, we had good reasons to believe that Alzheimer's is a good indication for partial reprogramming, mainly because Alzheimer's has a strong epigenetic component to its etiology, to, to, to the way Alzheimer's happens. And basically, gene expression in the brain cells of Alzheimer's patients can, could actually be, uh, can explain why the disease progression happens. As if you might remember, since epigenetic changes are reversible, we can be, at least with some confidence, expect that if we reverse the gene pattern, uh, the pattern of gene expression in the neurons of Alzheimer's patients, we can expect, if maybe even a reversal, like definitely slowing down of uh, Alzheimer's symptoms, may, maybe even a reversal of Alzheimer's symptoms. This was the theory. Now we have evidence in practice that this indeed seems to be the case. This is a study in an Alzheimer's mouse model showing that you can epigenetically prevent Alzheimer's. Then this is a, actually the study from 2019 that was the main inspiration for the hypothesis I just outlined, basically showing that you can epigenetically reverse Alzheimer's symptoms in a, in a mouse model. And basically it showed that epigenetic modulation can not only prevent the symptoms, but it can reverse them. And this was what made me very optimistic that in patients, we can observe the same reversal of symptoms using epigenetic modulation by partial reprogramming. And uh, uh, this is the paper I, I gave a preview in the beginning, and uh, it seems that we're running out of time. But I was very happy to see this. This is a 2023 late result, basically validating the same observations that we had at Youth Bio that partial reprogramming in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease can have beneficial effects, beneficial therapeutic effects on Alzheimer's mice, Alzheimer's symptoms. And also not only at the cognitive testing level, but also at the level of biomarkers, they show that you can have lower levels of beta amyloid, which is a key biomarker of Alzheimer's disease, lower plaque burden in, in these mice. And also on the cognitive tests, of course, those mice also showed better performance in those tests. And uh, this observations of this group validate our observations, which were very similar. We saw a reduction in beta amyloid, and we saw an improvement in cognitive tests in the, in the mice. And I briefly wanted to go over our results, but uh, it seems that I have only about five minutes. But um, basically, our, our main approach was, uh, our main tenet behind Youth Bio is that we need to be cell type specific, that uh, you have to have specificity in terms of triggering partial reprogramming in, in different cell types, and this was validated by Alejandro Ocampo, who, if you remember, was a pioneer of partial reprogramming. And uh, he's also our collaborator, but he showed that if you avoid the liver and the small intestine, you can push reprogramming for up to 10 days of consecutive expression of reprogramming factors, and that all of them might survive. But if you don't, if you keep uh, uh, reprogramming the liver and the small intestine, then the mice start dying after day four. And basically, this necessitates the cell type specific approach to reprogramming that you have to avoid certain tissues. And this means that from our standpoint, we can be uh, also targeted in the cells that we 
induce partial reprogramming in with uh, the uh, different cell types listed here. And of course, ne neuronal cell types are our first priority with Alzheimer's being the first indication. And it, relative to other companies, we already finished four animal studies, so we're quite uh, far ahead of our uh, peers in terms of getting to the clinic and getting to clinical validation of partial reprogramming. Our first indication is Alzheimer's disease, and there's, uh, I already mentioned, there's good reasons from a scientific standpoint, there's good reasons from a regulatory standpoint why Alzheimer's disease is a good indication for Alzheimer's. And our first animal study was as a proof of concept to show that we can deliver our therapeutic con constructs to the brain and activate them in the brain and get the expression of these factors in the brain. And once we validated that, with, we went into three different disease models with Alzheimer's, progeria, and age-related cognitive decline being the three models, and we saw positive results in, in those uh, tests. And uh, I'm getting the signal that uh, we're getting a short on time. And, uh, but basically, yeah, switching kind of our focus from the past to the future, the important factors in translating partial reprogramming, they're listed on this slide. And I think one of the main aspects is delivery. And this is really the, the, the last interesting aspect of the pre presentation that I'll go into, because a lot of people think delivery to the brain is a, like insurmountable challenge, but actually there's a lot of precedent in Parkinson's, and Jean already actually talked about this, in direct delivery of therapies to the brain, including cell th therapies and gene therapies, and this slide lists like a dozen different gene therapies that have been directly delivered to the brains of Alzheimer's patients by direct injection into the substantia nigra, and so, uh, also, this has been uh, shown in Alzheimer's disease as well, that you can deliver into the hippocampus, or at least very close to the hippocampus, the gene therapy. And this was a 2013 study, which then they had a follow-up like seven years later, showing that the patients that had this injection into their brain had sustainable expression of the delivered construct for like up to seven years, which makes me very optimistic that the, our constructs that we deliver to the brain can also be expected to be very long-lasting. And there, this is another paper showing the same uh, precedent of direct delivery into the brain. Uh, as I mentioned, this just sets, sets the precedent that this delivery is possible. But of course, uh, invasive delivery is, is not great. If we can avoid sticking a needle into patient brain, we should. And for that, there's now this concept of ultrasound guided delivery, where it's a non-invasive method of getting things to the brain. And this table lists like many different uh, mouse models of diseases in which this approach has been tried. And b b beyond mouse models, it was also demonstrated in patients already. This was a Toronto uh, Sick Kids uh, Hospital study that showed that you can have successful delivery into the brain of pediatric patients using ultrasound guided delivery. And uh, I won't get into <laughs> this slide just for the interest of time, but basically future directions of partial reprogramming they're listed here. Uh, I think we're well on our way of uh, finding novel factors. Some companies are dedicated to finding novel factors that are not as risky as Imanaka factors. Uh, new limit shift bio, their main mission is to find new factors. And I think we'll need tissue specific and cell type specific factors that will be most effective in a given cell type. And for, for that, you also need cell type specific delivery mechanism, which I think the field is also exploring. And uh, so in closing, I just want to say that I'm very optimistic that uh, both partial reprogramming and brain rejuvenation by partial reprogramming will get to the clinic very soon. And I just want to close with this quote from Dr. Belonte after they published the seminal Ocampo paper. With careful modulation, aging might be reversed. And I believe that with partial reprogramming, we're well on our way to figuring out just how to reverse the aging process. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>